Thank you for joining us today. You have joined today's webinar in listen-only mode. Please use the chat function located on the Zoom navigation menu to ask questions to our speakers and panelists and to engage in conversation related to today's webinar topic. If you have any technical issues, please privately message the host for assistance. Today's webinar will be recorded and available to registrants with the webinar slide deck and resources. At this time, Please welcome LPI senior researcher Jennifer DePauli for welcoming and introductory remarks. Thank you, Nicole. And hello, everyone. It is so nice to be here with you all today. Uh, as Nicole said, my name is Jen DePauli, and I am a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute. We appreciate you all taking the time to attend today's webinar. This webinar is presented in co sponsorship with AASA, the Superintendent's Association. Association and the Sold Alliance, and it is the sixth and final in our six-part series on transforming state education policy through a whole child approach. In our previous webinars, we dove into what the science of learning and development looks like when it's translated into both practice and policy. All of these webinars are available on our website and at the link in the chat. Today we will be diving into how we can redesign curriculum, instruction, and assessment based on the science of learning and development and drawn from our whole child policy toolkit. You can find the toolkit at the link in the chat, which will be dropped shortly. And it is my great honor to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Carol Lee. Dr. Lee is the Edwina S. Tari Professor Emirata at the Northwestern University School of Education and Social Policy. For 56 years, Dr. Lee has worked as a classroom teacher in primary and high school, at the community college level, and as a university researcher. She is currently president of the National Academy of Education, and her primary research has focused on, the, on cultural supports for learning. Dr. Lee, thank you for being here with us today, and I will hand it over to you. Oh, uh, great. Thanks, Jen. So, my presentation today. Uh, focuses on <clears throat> the whole child focus that has been the work of LPI for these many years with a specific attention to um, what this means for curriculum instruction and assessment. <clears throat> so these two graphics are ones with which I'm sure you're already familiar, the guiding principles for equitable whole child design 
as a sort of broad uh, framework for <clears throat> structures across the educational system that need to be in place to support whole child uh, development. And then the one on the right in terms of specifics around um, instruction <clears throat> and sort of the systems within schools and districts. <clears throat> what I want to do uh, in this um, brief presentation today is to sort of dig down deep into the specifics of, <clears throat> excuse me, how these broad principles about science of human learning and development uh, actually can translate into uh, instruction. Um, so big ideas that are emerging from the <clears throat> science of human learning and development first have to do with relations among <clears throat> physiological processes inherited from our evolution as a species and their adaptations through epigenetic processes and participation in cultural practices influencing goals and actions. I pay particular attention to this relationship between <clears throat> physiological processes that we inherit as a species as these are taken up in our participation in cultural practices, which suggests to me at least <clears throat> that these big ideas are really, really important if they have really an evolutionary uh, basis. And I'll discuss briefly what some of those dispositions are. <clears throat> Dynamic relations among different levels of ecological systems that structure resource allocations, processes of interaction within and across ecological contexts from micro, meso, um, macro through cultural historical time. The idea here being that Learning does not unfold in any single setting. Learning unfolds, <clears throat> excuse me, in people's participation within and across settings, within and across particular moments in broader cultural historical time, as well as where people or learners are in the life course. <clears throat> excuse me. As people engage in activity, how thinking unfolds through relations among thinking, feeling, and relationships, and how these relationships shape the nature required, the nature of knowledge required. The idea here being that, <clears throat> again, thinking, we have a, a strong focus in education on sort of technograph, technocratic, purely cognitive uh, aims of education. <clears throat> but what we know that thinking and feeling and perceptions are all intimately uh, connected. And if we're going to address whole child development in instructions, we need to be able to uh, take into account kids' perceptions of what they're doing and their emotional attachment that they attribute to their experiences of learning and the complexity of the kinds of knowledge that has that young people need to develop. It, <clears throat> develop excuse me. Then how development unfolds across and is influenced by <clears throat> different levels of time. So cultural historical time, the, for example, all of the discussions that are going on right now about learning and digital medium, particularly uh, out of school, this is a particular cultural historical moment that was not uh, uh, an issue, you know, decades ago. <clears throat> Ontogenetic, where learners are in the life course and what's going on microgenetically in terms of interactions in the particular settings <clears throat> in which learning is unfolding. And then finally, overall seeking to understand how this cauldron of development unfolds through diverse pathways at the level of individual variation, variation based on participation in and across multiple social communities that include the nuclear family, extended family, social networks, et cetera. This issue of diverse pathways, again, is a very central tenet to um, um, this science of human learning and development perspective and what it means to take into account both in the individual and the individual as members of a variety of groups, et cetera. <clears throat> One of the other takeaways from this work, again, is a, a more scientific warrant, if you will, <clears throat> excuse me, to these big ideas is that what we now understand is that complex networks within the brain interact with one another in dialogical processes in which emotions, cognition, and perceptions interact to fuel our actions. The bottom line idea here is that <clears throat> the, there are regions of the brain that involve emotions and perceptions that interact with cognitive processes and they operate in the same way that our brains uh, sort of detect physiological processes when I'm hungry, I'm having fever or pain, 
in terms of <clears throat> our reactions to perceptions of salience the, or perceptions of, 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 of threat, and that these are the same interacting systems that that um, manage all of our body systems. The point here simply being that emotions and perceptions as central contributors to human learning and development have to be a significant focus in the design of learning environments and even in assessments that we expect to give us <coughs> actionable um, uh, in information, <coughs> excuse me. These two images come from work of Barbara uh, Rogoff, her book, <clears throat> excuse me, The Cultural Nature of Human Development. Um, I show them simply as clear empirical evidence of the diversity of um, pathways of development across the world. So on the right side, there's a Iwe baby from Ghana who has a machete, uh, 11 months old, is able to manipulate that in terms of getting food. If you saw this image, you know, with your neighbor, you call the Department of Children and Family Services because we presume this is not developmentally possible for children, but it certainly is. On the right side, the Mayan girl who is a caretaker at six years old of her infant daughter, I'm an infant um, sibling. So the overarching takeaways from this work, we think are one that thinking and emotions are deeply intertwined and interdependent, that perceptions of the self and others and tasks and settings matter and that humans are adaptive and multiple pathways of development are both normative and essential. So the question here becomes, what do these big ideas mean in terms of how we think about instruction, curriculum, and assessment? The image you see here on the right is young man, Ben Underwood, Underwood, excuse me, who unfortunately I think is now deceased, became blind at the age of three and on his own in terms of individual variation, if you will, uh, developed a mechanism for being able to get around without um, uh, any support using the basic mechanism that whales do in terms of noise sort of reverberating. Again, individual variation and the ingenuity that that uh, that humans bring to, to challenge. <clears throat> this particular slide is in reference to a, st a study that I had been involved with some years ago, a young man that I've written about named Yetu. And again, I'm trying to demonstrate here the way in which these uh, big ideas about physiological processes, participation in human development, in, in, um, in uh, cultural practices, and where one is in the life course, and individual variation come into play. Just to try to illustrate that these ideas seem deeply complex, but they're actually, we see them every day. So in terms of human dispositions, we're disposed as humans to seek uh, attachments with other human beings. We know that human babies, when they're born, pay more attention to human beings than to objects. So this is the importance of attachments and relationships is well established in the scientific literature. For this young man, in terms of individual variation, he happens to be very introverted. And so he's, this is a, he's a freshman in high school at the time of the study. And so his sort of uptake of this need for attachment for him as an individual are complicated by his introversion. In terms of physiological uh, systems at, at play, he's in early adolescence, which means there are physiological changes that are taking place as he transitions uh, into adulthood, and that these physiological processes are very sensitive to any perceptions that he has of threat. In terms of participation in cultural practices, <clears throat> uh, cultural practices, in this case, mostly outside of school. The fact that he's a young African-American uh, young man living in a low uh, income community. This happens to be uh, in Chicago where there's a great deal of violence. You know, this was years ago, the same holds true uh, today. But in terms of um, his conceptions of his future possibilities as a man, again, very much deeply in intertwined and connected to cultural practices, in this case, outside of school. And then in terms of environmental uh, stimuli, that he's in a school where there's not high achieving, there's not high expectations in terms of academic work or development for him, uh, but there's high rigor uh, in the streets. And so what I've argued makes succeeding in school challenging for EA2 is one, the fact that he's at this transition point in terms of 
uh, adolescence, being a black uh, young man in, in America, being a black male living in poverty, the sort of messages in the, in the uh, cultural representations that he gets that are different than expectations in school. He has a history of schooling that has been challenging for him, being in high school, lots of different adults to, to sort of manage with. And I'm suggesting simply that in this exemplar, that if we're thinking about whole child development <clears throat> in the context of schooling, what this science of human learning development, it seems to me, suggests is that we need to be attending to all of these dimensions of challenge that he has. I'm also suggesting that in terms of the um, uh, implications of this science of human learning and development that suggests expanding our goals for learning beyond simple technocratic cognitive outcomes only, but whole child development in terms of developing a healthy sense of the self as an individual, as a member of cultural, multiple cultural communities, as a learner, uh, perceptions about future possibilities, health, thus both mental, physical, and emotional, learning to be uh, resilient in the face of challenge, and also preparation for citizenship. And that part of this preparation for citizenship has to do with developing dispositions to weigh multiple uh, uh, sources of evidence, multiple perspectives, to weigh competing evidence, excuse me, to uh, value uh, complexity, to develop uh, uh, ethical uh, um, um, dispositions to value uh, others and complex kinds of knowledge. And again, this, I think among the implications here are what then are the challenges for curriculum instruction at both the school, classroom, state district levels for these expanded goals. The takeaway overall here is that features of robust learning environments, one, position the learner as competent, anticipate sources of vulnerability, as I had suggested with uh, Yetu, examine and scaffold resources the learner brings, no matter what the conditions are, learners bring resources, and we need to understand those to make public the social good and utility of what it is we're trying to help children learn, making problem solving explicit in public, providing supports as the learners are engaged in complex problem solving and providing expansive opportunities and remaining adaptive over time. I want to sort of dig into them to what this sort of complex set of issues uh, suggest about knowledge in the, domain, the academic domains that we teach in the context of schooling. One is that <clears throat> um, very much, I think, what undergirds the thinking that we've all been engaged in is the importance of understanding what learners bring to academic learning, what <clears throat> is available in terms of their everyday knowledge that they accrue over time through participation in cultural practices, certainly outside of school. What are the implications for learning in the context of schooling? The kinds of knowledge that we want to look at are both conceptual knowledge, epistemological knowledge, revisiting what we think constitutes uh, appropriate knowledge in disciplines. And very often we're very constrained by very Eurocentric sort of views of what constitutes learning in the uh, domains. Uh, I'm gonna to try to illustrate the complexity of learning in domains, in this case, uh, with reading comprehension, which is my sort of area of, uh, of research uh, in practice. One is that reading is a relational skill. So even though we're getting in the public discussions now with NAEP scores and others post COVID that kids are uh, two years and three years behind, which is not actionable information. You can't do anything with it, doesn't mean anything that I can give every one of you in the audience who are expert readers, a text that will make, that will be challenging for you. That is because progressions of difficulty across grades are not based on simple readability uh, formulas that over the course of the K to 12 text change, the tasks that we ask kids to engage in change, and particularly the way in which reading and discipline plays out post-primary. So we need to be able to teach generic strategies, discipline-specific strategies, domain knowledge, as well as dispositions of inquiry. That there are also social emotional demands to learning how to become a competent a reader across a variety of kinds of texts. One is wrestling with uncertainty and complexity, a disposition to wrestle with that as opposed to retreat. 
wrestling with competing demands, particularly in middle and high school, uh, that the demands of what we ask kids to do in school are not the only things on their mind that they're wrestling with. Kids' perceptions of themselves and others, their ability to, uh, to uh, when they don't comprehend, to know what to do, if you will, the uh, uh, perceptions of what are they, we think they think we're asking them to do their perceptions of their peers and their teachers. We have a big challenge in schooling where uh, in many cases, particularly in uh, schools serving low income young people that um, they're so used to the idea that what's expected is just something in the teacher's head and the game is to figure out what the teacher wants, but not what does it mean to deeply interrogate. Then the cognitive demands, again, of reading comprehension are complex. They involve constructing, um, testing, and revising. So we're constantly trying to make sense as we read rather than simply after we've read the, the need to be metacognitive in terms of monitoring our understanding as we're reading and being able to repair, be able to integrate what we know with what the text is uh, presenting to us and taking stances that we can actually be critical and don't simply have to accept. There's a strong body of research uh, illustrating ways in which both assessments and uh, curricular pedagogical practices can connect with kids' everyday knowledge. So Bill Tate uh, was a math educator, uh, had done some work with, again, these were low income, largely African-American kids, gave them a math problem where they had to decide uh, whether it would be better to buy bus tickets day by day or weekly pass. The correct mathematical answer was to buy it daily. The kids said weekly because they could share the, 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 the tickets with uh, the passes with family and friends. Again, a different set of warrants if you didn't have a mechanism for trying to unearth and understand that, you just assume the kid couldn't solve that problem. Naila Nazir has done a lot of work with uh, kids who play basketball and their ability to, to um, understand the statistics in basketball, but not in classrooms. Ed Taylor did work with, uh, these were, I think, either kindergarten or first grade kids, low, low income, who would shop at a grocery store after school and the kinds of mathematical computation that they engaged with and developed assessments that matched onto that. Or uh, Jeff Sachs work with kids, poor kids who didn't even go to school, who were selling candy on the street. And then Brian Brown's work studying uh, uh, baseball, pitchers understanding of the physics of curved balls. Uh, try to close out now with just some illustrations from my own work and what I call cultural modeling, trying to capture these dimensions of um, human learning and development that I've discussed. One, this was a curriculum focused on the teaching of literary reasoning, but not simply for the purpose of the technocratic ends of analyzing literature, but for identity development. And so we selected text that was specifically aimed at supporting the African-American adolescents with whom we were working in wrestling with identity challenges. Our instructional design was particularly aimed at addressing kids' perceptions about themselves and what they were doing, the cognitive work that was demand that was involved in being able to engage in this rich literary analysis and the emotional uh, nature of the experiences they had trying to wrestle with these. We found in doing this work where we started off positioning this work, drawing on cultural funds of knowledge that these young African-American English speakers had, that they were able to engage with canonical texts with deep literary reasoning. But they, I point this example out is the other side of the picture here is the professional development that's necessary for teachers to understand what sometimes are displays of understanding based in everyday practices that they may not perceive. I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but simply to say that the discussions that these kids were having and the comments and questions they were raising were rooted in deep literary understanding, but the teacher couldn't hear them in the moment. And so the issue of what's necessary to provide teachers with the kinds of supports they need to do to do this kind of instruction. Um, this was from a story called um, um, Orion by Adambala by John Edgar Wideman. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details, but simply to say that it was a very complex text 
around a the notion of this enslaved African as a kind of messiah character in the story. The expert analysis we found very much mirrored what the kids saw and what they were able to extract in terms of talking about the symbolism in the text. But again, this was coming because we of the complex way in which we tried to address the multiple dimensions of learning for kids from a whole child development perspective. Closing out here, because we knew that there was more to learning than just simple cognitive knowledge, that we were attempting to support a strong um, epistemological orientation that you reading literature for a social meaning making for yourself and valuing multiple uh, readings of literary text and found these were positively correlated with our assessments of their ability to interpret literature and write literary arguments. We assess their perceptions about their ability to cope with challenge, again, positively correlated with our outcomes. We, we knew that perceptions were important, so we had measures of kids' perceptions of their experiences of this learning uh, environment. Again, these were positively correlated with outcomes. Their ability, their belief in um, an effort over sort of fixed intelligence was, again, positively correlated and uh, also measures of their racial identity. And again, a positive sense of racial identity was <clears throat> positively correlated with these outcomes. Sort of evidence of the, of the ability, even in large scale assessments, for those of you who are working at the district and state levels, this <clears throat> is a model from the PISA, the International PISA Assessment, <clears throat> excuse me, that is organized with a huge uh, database to not only deal with cognitive achievement, but also socio-emotional well-being and uh, sort of attainment, sort of what are the long-term consequences of this evidence of a standing system. I'll close with saying that <clears throat> this, this idea of the need to build a strong infrastructure to support this kind of teaching and learning. The example here you see on the right is from work from Beth Warren and Ann Roseberry in a project called Turk out of, uh, out of Shea Shea Conan, out of Turk in Boston. And um, there's this teacher is teaching in, a, I think it's a second or third grade class about plant growth. <clears throat> One of the children who responds, who is Hispanic or Latina young girl, but uh, her parents are, are university professors. She points to the graph that the teacher has taught in terms of sort of linear development. The other child who responds here, Elena is first generation, a Latina immigrant, um, English is her you know, second language. And she responds to the teacher's question about plant growth, talking about how her feet feel when, the, when her shoes are too tight and her feet are growing. And the teacher's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. She then brings that problem of practice to a group in Turk, I mean, in Shea Shea Kona that involves teachers and researchers working together and they work through to understand what are the underlying warrants that this, that this child is presenting. Turns out it's a very powerful idea in the history of science called in terms of embodied uh, cognition, imagining yourself inside of a phenomena that you don't thoroughly understand. So I'm just closing here just to say that these goals that I've tried to very briefly uh, illustrate are deeply complex, and it's very important that we're able to build infrastructure to support teachers and districts in doing this work, both in terms of curriculum uh, and, 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 and assessments. And this factory model that we have right now does not support uh, being able to do that work. So with that, I will close because I think I'm a bit over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I, I know that and I'm so happy that we'll have your slides available to folks because there's so much to dig in on. Um, but that was a really nice encapsulation, I know, in a very short amount of time of um, what it actually means when we talk about whole child learning and development and how critical that is. Um, so thank you. Um, I, we're now going to move over to our panel. Um, I am happy to introduce my colleague, Anisha Bajranarian, who is the Director of State Performance Assessment at the Learning Policy Institute, where she leads projects related to state performance assessments. For the last decade, her work has focused on supporting states 
districts and educators to develop and implement student-centered systems of assessment that support all learners. Anisha, passing it over to you. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, really excited to be here with you all today. And thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for that really thought-provoking um, presentation on how important it is that we consider all aspects of students' lived experiences and identities when we're thinking about how we can best support them in our educational systems. I know it's given me a lot to think about, and I'm very excited to discuss the last point that um, Dr. Lee raised for us in terms of the infrastructure. Um, how do we, in districts and states, really think about setting up systems that can enable this kind of teaching and learning in classrooms together. So I'm very excited to have with me today some illustrious state and district leaders um, to, to discuss this point. We have with us Peter Leonard, who is the Executive Director of Student Assessment and MTSS for Chicago Public Schools. Peter and his team empower um, CPS stakeholders with high quality evidence of student learning to advance achievement, access, and opportunity for all students by leading policy, strategy, implementation, and support across all assessment and MTSS programs. Peter also represents CPS in various state level groups serving on the Illinois State Assessment Review Committee and the P20 Council's Committee on Data Assessment and Accountability. Welcome, Peter. We also have with us Sharon Nikes, from, uh, who currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Superintendent of Academic Content at the Louisiana Department of Education. Uh, Sharon ensures that teachers, school leaders, and school system leaders have the tools, resources, and knowledge necessary to make meaningful growth for every student every day by helping create and maintain a coherent academic structure of aligned standards and curriculum, assessments, and professional development. Welcome, Sharon. So excited to have you. And we have Sarah Young, who serves as the Chief of Staff at the Utah State Board of Education. Um, in her work, Sarah works to bring next generation learning to Utah's public schools. Her projects have included the state's digital teaching and learning initiative and development of Utah's portrait of a graduate. Uh, Sarah ensures that these initiatives are centered in creating learning environments that foster 21st century skills for Utah students. Welcome, Sarah. We're so excited to have you here with us as well. Um, so. To, to lead off on our, our discussion today, um, Dr. Lee's uh, description of what meaningful teaching and learning looks like really has me thinking, because when I think of traditional curriculum, instruction, and assessment systems, I have a really hard time not sort of immediately picturing the rows of students passively accepting information with someone at the front of the room who's really just sort of serving as a, as a way to transmit disconnected ideas and facts um, that aren't really connected to student learning. But as Dr. Lee sort of raised for us, that is not the best scenario <laughs> in which students learn um, and demonstrate their learning. We know that to unleash students' potential, we need to provide learning opportunities that are authentic, that build metacognitive skills, that allow them access to deep content knowledge, through connections to their own lives and to the information that is meaningful to them, um, and that they need to be able to learn and apply their understanding in these like in these much more authentic and relevant in real world ways. And so I'm going to ask each of you to tell us a little bit of, about your work and how your state or district is working to create deeper, more authentic learning experiences for young people. And um, Sarah, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind, um, telling us a little bit about how you're thinking about this in Utah. Of course. Thank you for having us and for the opportunity to spotlight um, the State Board of Education's work in this area. So it was actually prior to the pandemic um, in 2017 and 18 that our State Board of Education had a really critical conversation with our community in terms of what is the expected outcome of being a graduate here in K-12 um, within the state of Utah. And in doing a listening and design thinking process um, across the entire state with a variety of stakeholders stakeholders, including our parents and our students, we ultimately arrived at an outcome that really did reflect a lot of the um, conversations from Dr. Lee related to the whole child and moving not just 
beyond academic mastery to be able to include things along the lines of skills, um, but also looking at some of those necessary dispositions um, that were really important to our community, like respect and service. And so that led us to create our state portrait of a graduate that really has served as the North Star for a lot of the future decision making um, and next steps that occurred, not just during the pandemic, but also um, in terms of post pandemic to make sure that we are really orienting the system to be able to support a more holistic approach to education that ultimately leads to the outcomes that are articulated in our portrait of a graduate. Thanks, Sarah. That North Star idea, and I know that the um, the idea of a portrait of a graduate has been so powerful in local communities, and it's really it's really wonderful to hear think you're thinking about this at the state level as well. And I, this idea of a North Star is something that I find really compelling. Sharon, I know in Louisiana, you've also been thinking about sort of how to how to put forward a really meaningful. North Star to guide your um, curriculum instruction and assessment efforts. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's looking like in Louisiana? Yeah, sure. And I know Louisiana have a reputation about it, but we really think through and decided um, classroom instruction is the most impacted by three components, curriculum assessment and teacher professional development. So our underlying theory of action at, LD at LDU is to make sure those three components are tightly aligned for maximum input on student learning. So we work every day to build strong coherence around curriculum assessment and teacher professional development. So I know kind of most states think, oh, they review curriculum and they tell you know systems what to use. We don't, we're a local control state. Uh, school systems, schools choose the curriculum that they want, but we try to make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. So we have a really best, robust curriculum review um, uh, process and we you know, engage in contracts with, with educators and train them. We're reviewing before ed reports and we put out a list of tiered curriculum. And then we have another vendor list for professional learning providers that's specifically tied to the curriculum. We don't do curriculum agnostic. We want content pedagogy in the hands of teachers because then the results for the students are so much stronger. Um, and we're doing that last little piece, that alignment of assessment as well. Um, really thinking through that traditional summative assessment at the end that Dr. Lee was talking about sometimes is disconnected from students. I think the work that we push forward most on this is our innovative assessment around ELA. Uh, we review curricula, but in, in the space when the standards first changed, we also developed an ELA curriculum, ELA guidebooks. The majority of our state use it because we can be nimble, create units that are specific for locals, like we have a Cajun folktales units, it's Louisiana, uh, that you probably won't get a, in another state. And so we designed a through course assessment, uh, particularly aligned to that curriculum first, where instead of waiting to the end of the year for a summative assessment, after I finish my unit, I take a, a through course assessment with a passage from the text that was in my unit. So, you know, don't preference background knowledge, everybody's on an equal playing field. Um, we've moved forward to do that with other curricula and other subjects, but really thinking through that alignment, how can we get tightly aligned a curriculum assessment and professional learning for teachers so that the student's experience um, is, is, is rounded and fulfilled in what it needs to be. Thanks, Sharon. And that's, I mean, it's it's so interesting to hear sort of the, the state pro portrait of a graduate approach, that to, that approach to coherence, you talking a little bit about curriculum and, and really sort of locally relevant curriculum as a potential point of coherence here. Um, and so I'm really excited, Peter, like you work at a different level of the system, you know, Sarah and Sharon are thinking about this in terms of what's going to enable this work across the districts in their state. You are working in a district. Can you tell us a little bit about what this looks like as you get closer and closer to the classroom to um, to create work that is really authentic and meaningful for students? Absolutely, Anisha, and thank you for having me. I will caveat it with that Chicago is bigger than many states, <laughs> so <Fair. laughs> depending how you want to think about us. Um, and I saw uh, many international folks joining, so just to set some context for Chicago, uh, we are a district that serves over 300,000 students across uh, over 600 schools. We're the fourth largest district uh, in the United States with just under half of our students, uh, Hispanic or Latinx background, and just over a third uh, African-American. 
It was great to listen to Dr. Lee. Ten years ago, I was a student in uh, in her classroom. Uh, so great to continue to get the chance to learn from her. Connecting to what Sarah said, so in CPS, we also have what we call the graduate profile. We've also been thinking a lot about the North Star closer to the classroom. So our chief education officer has launched what we're calling our instructional core vision, just saying we want to get back to what does the interactions between students, teachers, and content look like. And to educate for equity, our instructional core vision centers identity, community, and relationships so that we're empowering students to connect, imagine, and act as ethical, critical actors in the world. And so that's organized an entire shift from setting the vision to what is that infrastructure, to your point, Anisha. Um, and so one of our big focuses has been on that curriculum piece. So we saw that across Chicago, more than half of teachers said that they didn't have a relevant curriculum in their content area. And so we launched uh, back in 2019, an initiative um, that has resulted in what's called Skyline, which is our curriculum equity initiative, where we've worked with partners and over 300 teachers to adapt existing curricula to ensure that any teacher can have high quality, culturally relevant, Chicago connected curriculum that they can use within their classroom that so that students can both have that window into the world and a mirror reflecting their experience. We've really partnered that with curriculum embedded assessments because our big push around assessment is how we can bring assessment closer to the learning because the change in ex learning acceleration outcomes come there. And so although it's uh, adoptions voluntary, currently our Skyline curriculum is used in at least one uh, grade level and content area in over 80% of our schools. And we're supporting schools through that curriculum audit, the engagement on what the right curriculum is, and the professional learning that allows them to focus on strong implementation and the instructional core experience for students. Thanks, Peter. Um, one thing that I find really heartening is just all three of you live in different states, you're working in different contexts, but as you were talking, a lot of the the policies, the language, the activities that you're engaging in, sort of like on paper, they would read as very coherent, even just amongst the three of you here who are operating in really different contexts. So I find that heartening, but also know <laughs> that um, while many of these supports are intended within a given state, within a given district, within a given school, are intended to enable and complement work at different levels of the system, that this isn't always a perfect fit. Um, and so Sharon and Sarah, I'm gonna start with you both. And I'm wondering how do you think about, you sort of, you've described coherence of the full system. How do you specifically think about coherence with your local communities, with your districts and your schools? Um, and how do you think about like the support that you're providing and, and how it is interacting with enabling and at times maybe posing barriers for what's happening locally. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about that? And Sharon, I'll start with you this time. Sure. Um, I will say after our initial um, push that I start, we started reviewing curricula informally in 2013. I can't believe it's been 10 years. Um, that's where we started. Like that's the meat of the work. We've done this at the state level. We pushed that out. We're supporting systems. And we've been doing now the work within school systems and making sure instructional leadership teams are aligned at the system level, the school level, and then with the teacher level, with teacher collaborations following up on that. So supporting those systems, students selecting what's your high quality curriculum, how does it meet your local needs, who are your professional learning partners, who you're reaching out to, making sure that's aligned, and what does every day look like for teachers and planning that curriculums for the needs of their students. Um, really helping them understand that the curriculum is a floor, uh, not the ceiling. It's to sure that teachers aren't struggling to find something every day to teach, but they're taking those materials and crafting them in the way that meet the needs of their students every day in their context. Yeah. Building that understanding at different levels through our department um, pushouts for professional learning. Um, we have a, we're getting ready to go next week, 6,000 educators in New Orleans for our teacher leader summit, where we kind of level set for the work for the next year. Uh, and that's gonna be really structured in that ILT model from the system to the school down to teacher collaboration. Um, but that's the, the next part to make sure we're all aligned. And I'm gonna kick it over to Sarah. I'm sure she's got lots to add. 
No, I appreciate the question. Um, and it's actually one that we grappled with at the state because we are very fortunate to have very innovative districts. And I'll call out one of our district, Juab School District, who had a portrait of a graduate that predated and really helped inspire our work at the state level. So we were really conscious of, you know, not wanting to supplant um, that local innovation, but instead creating an arena where we signal to all of our schools that not only was it okay, but it was supported and celebrated. And so with our portrait of a graduate, we've been very clear with all of our individual districts and charter schools um, that we encourage them to engage in the exact same process with their community, um, to go through and develop their own local portrait of a graduate. Many have done that, and we've seen a lot of overlap and coherence between what was identified across the state, as well as what they're seeing at the local level. To that end, what we've done as a state entity to try and balance between being able to provide supports and resources for coherence, but also allowing for that local innovation, is we um, partnered with the state to be able to create the K-12 um, competencies, which we actually expanded to P-20, meaning that they um, start in preschool and go all the way through our higher education. So those competencies were really designed to be a jumping off point then for each of our districts to say, so which of these elements really resonate with our local portrait of a graduate to more so serve as a model and a library as opposed to an edict or something that had to be done. In addition, in addition to that, we created model rubrics. Um, those rubrics are designed through a student assessment lens. So asking our students to take on that agency to be able to say, where am I in progressing in these areas as opposed to that being an adult function. Um, and again, really serving as a library for our local schools to be able to select from to honor that, that local control component. The last thing I'll say is that we actually went through all of our policies um, here at the state board with a couple of partners partners, and we identified what we kind of call our flexibility guide. And that's where we go through and say, these are all the existing flexibilities that support the design um, related to moving towards the portrait of a graduate outcome, so that we were really highlighting those opportunities to kind of give and signal and document and code that this is okay. And we really, it supports you in moving that direction. That's so interesting. Like, I, I love the listening to both of you highlight sort of like the ways to make sure everyone's on the same page and has a common understanding. And then also, how do you enable and message that there's so much flexibility and you're not sort of trying to constrain work? I, I think it's a really interesting um, set of ideas for us to think about. Peter, how does this work for you in a district? Like, I'm wondering, how does this functionally play out for you when you're thinking about the supports that the state does provide or could provide and how they how they enable or potentially create inadvertent barriers for your work. Yeah, thanks, Anisha. It was fascinating listening to uh, both of you reflect on your states. From a district, exp district experience, we deal with some of those similar issues right in our management of schools. So from the curricular side, we have local curricular autonomy and we're trying to align incentives, offering structures to provide the right level of flexibility to local control, but ensuring we get to that same outcome. In our engagement with the state, I also want to acknowledge that the kind of governance policy and political environment state by state are very different in the relationships between districts and states. Um, in Illinois and for Chicago, for me, when the state does the big things states are supposed to do excellently, it opens up so many opportunities for districts, right? Things like setting the right standards that signal what students need to know and be able to do, developing things like the graduate profile, the adoption of updated Spanish, Spanish language art standards in a state with many Spanish speakers that opens up the possibility to explore native language Spanish assessment in the future, right? Something as what may seem small for us, but turning around our large scale assessment return from July to May now allows districts and teams to really do strong end of year analysis and summer planning. So when our state is really effective, it's when they are really able to convene a, a broad array of stakeholders around the big decisions and then execute on those decisions really well and empower the people closest to the ground to pick that ball up and move it forward on behalf of students. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for that reflection. And I think this is giving us a really rich and sort of like a whole view of the, the different ways that our policies and practices at the systemic level can support this vision for um, curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, Peter, you just mentioned, you sort of, you brought up sort of like the, the ways that states can and think about assessments um, and the assessment supports that are provided um, in service of, of positive instructional moves. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, Sharon, you mentioned this a little bit too, but I'm wondering if um, I can ask you all to reflect on this a little bit more. I think very often when we hear conversations about curriculum instruction and assessment at the systemic level, there's a lot of excitement about some of the opportunities on the curriculum and instruction side and a little bit of hesitation or tension around the assessments piece of it and what what exactly can we do with our assessment systems to position them to do more more good than harm certainly and good in general as opposed to just sort of like not serving um, a positive and instructional use and so Peter, I wonder if I can toss this back to you since you just brought this up and if you have reflections on what would enable a state assessment or state to sort of put forward assessment systems that are more meaningful for the teaching and learning that you're trying to enact in Chicago. Thanks, Nisha. For, we need to get more people excited about innovative assessment practices is one of my <laughs> main takeaways here because I'm, uh, I'm fired up. Uh, so I think of key part of that question is what is the role of the state in doing that, right? When is the state creating versus when is the state enabling? Um, we think about a balanced assessment system within Chicago, and a lot of those state assessments fit at the top of our pyramid in those large-scale assessments. But one of the powerful things about a large-scale assessment or any assessment is it makes what it means to have mastered or be proficient in a standard visible. We can all read a standard and have general ideas about what it looks like for a student to know and be able to do that thing. But we don't concretize it until we create a situation that elicits some level of performance from a student. And that's what an assessment does. So a quality large scale assessment signals to an entire state the types of things a student needs to know and be able to do to be successful in that grade level. My argument would be that everything else belongs to the districts in terms of how to make that real well in an assessment system that's connected to curriculum. Mm -hmm. A state can really effectively set the standard, help people understand the standard, connect that back to practice, but where the rubber hits the road, it's going to be closer and closer to the classroom for that unpacking to having a curriculum that sequences students towards that learning, that provides for assessment experiences for a student that can move more towards the culturally responsive end where students are able to activate and tap into their cultural and linguistic assets and histories to bring that to their assessment experiences. So mm -hmm. for me, it's a great stake in the ground around quality and then the enabling system to be able to bring that assessment work closer to the learning. Thanks, Peter. Sarah or Sharon, do you want to weigh in here? Um, to me, things Peter said excite me because some of the work we're doing and some of the work obviously we want to do on our curriculum work, of course, doubling down on curriculum and that assessments that I always think of it, people use assessments for very different things. Some can be inform instruction moving forward. That's our curriculum vetted assessments. Don't go out looking for something else that's going to send you somewhere. What am I going to do with my students next in the next unit lesson based on those assessments? Um, but how can we mirror more that towards what folks use assessments for otherwise? State scale assessments for accountability. Um, you know, we live in the world we do. Uh, there are policies and laws around that. There's you know, a lot of things that aren't going to change, but what, how can we innovate, like Peter said, to make sure we're getting closer between the marriage of the information we're gathering here for this purpose can also be gathered there for, for that purpose. And I know I shared the link for the innovative assessment. We, did, I, we kicked off at Guidebooks, uh, experimenting with a, another vendor curriculum, Great Minds, Wit and Wisdom in grade five, because um, it's also widely used in Louisiana. Um, and then you know, and she, you know, really close with some of the science work. How can we ground that to, to learning in places and, and the experience of the, of the whole child? Um, 
I'm excited about that. I know folks use assessments for different things and we can have feelings and ideas about the accountability, but there, if we can't get change things, how can we at least mirror it so um, it doesn't feel so much like an other because we're grounding this experience or curriculum within the, the needs of, of our students and that we doesn't feel like we're stepping out on other to do another thing or assessing them on something different. How can we get closer to the information we're getting from those curriculum embedded assessments as well? Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, and I'll just add to it um, twofold. So Utah has um, engaged in a process over the past year and a half related to accountability redesign um, specific to our portrait of a graduate and our PCBL components. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be bold on behalf of the panel to say that those elements that need to change at the federal level related to the codes and responsibilities, that the wave is coming. If you're not hearing it, here in terms of the fact that Louisiana, Illinois, and Utah are already moving this direction. We are not alone in terms of being states who are in this effort and part of this conversation. And that the more states who bring this to the door of the U.S. Department of Education to say this is the direction that we are going, we would like you to come with us, um, I think just really helps to instigate the change. So we're interested in being a part of that coalition to move towards a more whole child policy policy related to the way that we're reflecting the successes and the areas of need of our schools. Um, and I'm excited to, to be a part of the work um, with my fellow panelists and others who are, I'm sure, um, excited to lead the way. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, for our penultimate question of this panel, um, I want to pivot a little bit to more recent experiences. Um, specifically during the um, pandemic related disruptions to um, teaching, learning and assessment processes. Um, Sarah, you mentioned this a little bit in your opening um, remarks, but you know, we know COVID has of course presented many challenges for schools, but it's also opened up some opportunities around curriculum instruction and assessment, um, both in terms of opportunities that the, the disruption itself may have created, as well as federal responses to that disruption in terms of funding of availability and things like that. And so I'm wondering if um, Sarah, Sharon, or Peter, if, if, you, if something in particular comes to mind in terms of how the pandemic has allowed you to be more innovative in your curriculum instruction and assessment work. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so one of the things that was so just tangible for us was the importance of having a portrait of a graduate with those articulated skills and dispositions. Um, when we shifted to an online format for learning, um, which kudos to every single educator who made that that shift, it was definitely a solution of triage. Um, it wasn't one that was, um, at least in our state, you know, planned out uh, in terms of support and implementation. One of the things that we quickly realized is the app aspects that we were missing were everything beyond content. Content was what we could continue to deliver. And yet that did not meet the expectations of our families and our students in terms of what does school mean? And so for us, that just reinforced the importance of the portrait of our graduate because those things were happening in our schools when our kids were in face-to-face -face learning. Um, in addition to that, from a policy perspective, I'll just say that we had to do kind of emergency waivers of a lot of traditional rules. One of the rules in Utah was specific to using a 180-990 model of how we um, allocate funding. Um, and all of a sudden, in a digital setting, that just didn't work in the same way that it had when we had, you know, primarily face-to-face -face instruction. And that flexibility continues to stand in Utah. Um, so our State Board of Education um, has continued to allow for additional flexibilities, which for us has really opened the door to what types of personalized and competency-based learning models can be implemented in our schools to better meet the needs of students um, without necessarily um, you know, holding our schools to a loss of funding account since it may not translate to the exact same number of hours in person. So it would just be an example I'd share, but we actually really appreciated the opportunity to add in those flexibilities and appreciate that our board's been incredibly thoughtful about not just revoking them the moment that, you know, the pandemic started to wane in terms of our application and changes of the system. Thank you so much, Sarah. 
Um, we are just about up on time with our uh, with our panel today. So I want to give you all one your sort of final word on um, today, and I want to ask you what advice would you give another state or district leader who wants to move toward richer, more authentic learning experiences for students? And Peter, because I think I just cut you off because you were going to offer something awesome about what COVID opened up for you. Um, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> it was probably the right move to cut me off. I would have talked for 10 minutes. It would have been bad for everybody's time. Um, I think I have five things here. It's to start by anchoring yourself in the learning sciences right, to talk about what Carol said, it's not a technocratic approach, it's a student learning first. Refocus on the instructional core. What do the daily learning experiences look like for students? Ensure that you're bringing that equity lens to the work and you're seeing what that experience looks, sounds, and feels like for every kid. Or is ask and listen to students. We're really passionate in Chicago about elevating student voice and integrating in that to how we do continuous improvement at every layer. And uh, the fifth one is is be ambitious. I think Sarah's got everyone inspired with her uh, with her stump speech a little bit ago, and want to want to lean into that. Be ambitious for for what we're asking for on behalf of kids. Thanks, Peter. Sharon. Uh, I would say if you're working at the state level, and I think mean, Peter gave a nod to this of what state levels can do. Try to make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. Envision what you want the outcome to be and think through at the different levels at the school system level as the funding level that Sarah pointed out at the school level at the teach like what are the blockers for them doing the right thing that you want to do? Obviously a local decision about the the the, the intricacies, but what at the state level can you do? Like our IMR process ends up with a state level contract with folks so that School systems don't have to do competitive bidding on their own. What blockers can you move at the state level to take care of it, to make the right thing to do, the easy thing to do for, for systems, um, schools, and teachers? Thanks, Sharon. And Sarah, last word. Yeah, um, I'm going to echo something Peter said, which is the involvement of students. So um, different student groups that consulted and gave input to our portrait of a graduate um, included not just like our traditional CTE and student council leaders. Um, we went to our freshmen who were in our Utah universities and colleges to be able to get their input about what the needs were. Um, and most importantly, we visited with our youth in custody specific to making sure that, um, that their voices about where the systems didn't work for them um, were heard and recognized in terms of what's the value out of school. Um, ultimately, my biggest piece of advice that I'll give is for anyone who's a parent, you should look at this through the lens of what do you want for your kid? And it's like, and if you want it for your kid, you should have a conversation about then how are we allowing that to happen for all children and use that as your kind of guiding, you know, effort and what motivates you to be able to make it happen so that all of our kids have these opportunities in their schools um, to improve their outcomes for the future. Thank you so much, Sarah. Jen, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thank you, Anisha. I am I am feeling inspired. I hope everybody else is. That was fantastic. And um, just want to say thank you to Anisha and Peter and Sarah and Sharon and Dr. Lee and our co-sponsors, AASA and the Sold Alliance. Um, today's the last webinar of our six-part series. We hope you've enjoyed it. This webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be made available shortly. Um, we ask that you do a quick survey if you have the time that will be dropped in the chat. And um, we just want to say thank you for everyone who has supported this webinar series. We hope you've enjoyed it. And please stay tuned for future opportunities to learn more about whole child policy from LPI and all of our wonderful partners. Thank you.